come out so as to increase the chances that we stay on schedule. So Bradley Smith is presently a research fellow at Central Queensland University, strangely enough in Adelaide, which is not in Central Queensland. I don't understand the geography, geographic labeling of Australian universities. I first got to know Bradley hmm, four or five years ago when he was doing a PhD on the behavior and cognition of dingoes, which he was doing at the University of South Australia, which is in South Australia, strangely enough. Um, absolutely fascinating work, and his university invited me to be an examiner on his PhD thesis, and I jumped at the opportunity, naively imagining that that implied I was getting a free ticket to Australia. But in fact, uh, they just sent me a copy of the thesis by mail, and I had to write a report. But it's absolutely fascinating stuff. And uh, I can see he's ready now, Bradley Smith. Thanks, Clark. So today I'd like to talk to you about keeping all the personality and behavior of wild canids kept as domestic pets or as household pets. And I'm gonna use the Australian dingo as an example or as a case study of, of uh, one of those wild canids. Now we've been selecting for, well, uh, characteristics or traits in dogs that we find desirable and selecting against those traits that we don't find desirable or what we find undesirable. And it's those traits that allow the dogs to conform to the human environment and, and they're what we want in a dog. Now wild canids of course haven't been selected for these traits and they're more selected for um, life in the wild. So logically you'd think that wild canids do not conform to these um, traits, these ideal traits that we have and therefore don't make good household pets. So lots of people, including breeders and dingo owners, they all warn against dingo ownership and they, they say it's not a good idea. You don't want a dingo as a pet. Now, long, -term, uh, long time dingo breeder Barry Oakman sums it up quite well when he said, the very wild nature of the dingo that makes it so fascinating is diametrically opposed to the suburban dictates of backyards, restraint and domesticity. So it begs the question then, why do people choose to keep dingoes as pets? Despite these warnings, and especially since we have access to domestic dogs who are far better suited to life um, in our backyards. And I can tell you one reason, and it's because wild, wild canid puppies are so cute. <laughs> but, but the thing is, they don't stay cute and cuddly and well behaved for very long. For example, <laughs> Things, things can change quite quickly, and they get up to all sorts of mischief. In Australia, we've had a fascination with, the Austra with, with wild canids, with the Australian dingo, for a quite a long time. And it started with the indigenous Australians who used to poach or get puppies from dens and hand raise them. You know, they'd use them as, as kind of companions and pets and, and play around, until about a year, year or so, um, of age when the dingoes would reach maturity and then they would go back to the wild and the process would start again. So it doesn't really uh, constitute domestication, but there was a pretty intricate relationship between dingoes and, um, and indigenous Australians. They were a very big part of their lifestyle and their mythology. But they were a bit of a pain in the butt. And I don't think that they were very uh, useful. They weren't practical as hunting assistants and, and all that kind of thing. Um, in fact, this is an example of, um, a, of a community who has to build platforms to keep dogs and dingoes away from food. Um, they also used to have to bury um, uh, bodies in trees to stop the dogs getting to them. So it's a bit of an example of, of, uh, of how um, you know, dingoes or wild, pet, wild canids don't make good pets even for them. Now, as soon as the Europeans arrived in Australia, they brought with them the dog. And the dogs were favored far better um, than dingoes because you know, they could train them, they were a bit more obedient, and they were more useful and practical as hunting assistants. So they basically stopped getting dingoes and, and concentrated on dogs. And in a bit of a reversal of, of, of interest, the European settlers became fascinated with the dingo, and they started to keep the dingo as pets, and they, they even sent them back to England with them as gifts and, and kind of trophies, I guess, to people that they knew. Uh, Governor, um, Governor Arthur Phillip, who was the, one of the, the first governors of um, New South Wales, uh, sums it up quite well, uh, basically that they're quite savage and they couldn't really control, um, control the dingoes or their behavior. Um, and they used to lose a lot of chickens and, and uh, sheep around the, the, um, the campsites or the, the settlements. 
And today, of course, we, 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 have a, we have quite a few people who own dingoes as pets in Australia. And I think there's roughly about 200, but, but we're not sure. There is many states, though, or many parts of Australia where you can't keep dingoes. It's illegal to keep them as pets. And where you can keep them as pets, there's quite a few regulations um, and rules around keeping them. So it's quite, quite strict, and um, again, not many people do it. And it's not to say that dingoes don't make good pets, because I know people that, that have quite a good relationship with, with pet dingoes. Um, but it does take, take a special type of person and a special type of dingo um, to make it happen. Now, I've mentioned to you that, that people don't recommend dingoes as pets and they don't make good pets. And here are the, some, of the, some of the reasons why. Because they're really intelligent. They're neophobic, so they're, they're scared of new things and new people and new experiences. They have strong prey drive. They're difficult to train. They escape a lot. They're destructive when they're left alone. Uh, as you can see, the leather couch is now um, not, so, not so leathery anymore. They're also destructive, um, like I said, uh, independent and very diff difficult to socialize. And all this leads to quite a higher rate of rel relinquishment. So when you get, dingoes get about a year, year or so old, um, that's when, when, when things start to go wrong. Owners start to, to um, not be able to cope with keeping the dingoes, and they then um, you know, either get rid of them, put them in shelters, or, or whatever. Um, all, all these experiences seem quite similar to my, my understanding of wolf-dog hybrids. Um, so it seems to be, be quite a trend with, with wild canids. Yet yeah, nobody has looked or compared wild canids to, uh, to um, domestic dogs um, in terms of personality and behavior. So can we quantify these differences in personality and behavior? Um, do, do they live up to, to what we, we know and we, we talk about them as? And what are the differences, as James Serple said, asked earlier, the difference between these kind of ancient breeds, breeds and also the, the modern breeds? So I went out and I surveyed um, 40 dingoes. Um, it's a, I know it's not a very big number, but it's a reflection of the amount of dingoes that are actually um, as pet, pet dingoes in Australia. And just a few important things to mention in terms of the, I guess, the demographics of the dingoes is that most of them are, are entire, so they're used for um, breeding purposes and things like that. So they're, um, they're unlike dogs who, especially in Australia, most of them are actually neutered. And most dingoes live in multi-dingo households, so most dingo owners will have more than one, so there's usually you know, you know, two or three dingoes. And surprisingly, I thought, when we asked them if, they, if their dingo had any behavior problems, 80% um, of them said that they didn't, so that they, you know, they have quite a good relationship with, the, with their dingoes that they have, and not many behavioral problems. And what I, what I wanted to do was look at two aspects, personality and behavior, using two different types of methods. So one being the, let's look at their, their traits and, their, and, and you know, their, their general kind of temperament and, and personality, and then look at some behavior evaluations of specific contexts um, and how they would behave in those contexts. So the first one I'll talk about is the personality. And I used the Monash Canine Personality Questionnaire, which I think Julie just um, explained to you um, just before. And this is a 26-item owner-rated questionnaire, and it really just, just asks for um, owners to, to rate adjectives um, or words to describe the, the dingo personality. And it's matched quite closely with the big five personality um, factors that Sam spoke about earlier. What I did, though, first was I wanted to see what words, what adjectives are actually used by, by dingo uh, people, by, by d people who have dingoes as pets. So I, I went through all the books, uh, anything that I could find where people talked about and described their, their dingoes. And I, I just put a list here of all the, all the words that came up quite, quite often. And I've, I've placed them in the, the five kind of factors um, that the, the MCPQ Jackie Lay had, has kind of developed. The ones in bold are the ones that um, have been used to describe dingoes and also appear um, in the MCPQ. And I compared the dingoes to over 400 Australian dogs um, that have been um, previously tested by, by Jackie, who, who designed the questionnaire. And I found that dingoes were higher in self-assuredness and they were lower in training focus. They also were no different between, in terms of extroversion, um, amicability, and neuroticism. So what does this mean? Well, you know, it showed that dingoes and, and dogs were similar in, in a few ways, including um, energy and extroversion, uh, friendliness and sociability, and nervous energy and fear. Now, this is quite surprising to me because, 
a lot of the literature talks about dingoes being shy and with, withdrawn and, and you know, not, nothing quite like that. So I was quite interested in, to see, um, to look into that a bit further. However, as expected, dingoes were considered less attentive and reliable, uh, less able to be trained and less obedient, um, and definitely more independent natured, persevering, dominant and opportunistic. Now to look at the other type of, of, uh, of method that I wanted to look at was the, I used the sea bark. So you've, you've had the privilege of hearing James talk all about the sea bark. So again, I won't go too much into the details of the, of the questionnaire. Suffice to say that um, there's a hundred items, the owners rate the, the dingo's behavior based on certain uh, scenarios basically. Um, And to look at some, and what I did was compared the dingoes to a lot of the dogs that are in the Seabark database. So quite a, quite a few different breeds of dogs uh, to compare them against. And found that dingoes scored significantly higher in, uh, in escaping, likelihood to escape, uh, in chase behavior, also predatory prey drive behavior, um, high in energy, stranger directed fear, and also chewing or you know, destroying things like the couch that I showed you earlier. Now the dogs scored higher, um, not surprisingly, in trainability, in their attachment to the, to the owners, um, to barking, because um, you know, dingoes are more likely to, to howl and they don't really bark that much. Uh, in owner-directed and stranger-directed aggression, uh, dog-directed dog fear, and also touch sensitivity. And just like the personality, there, there were some, some things that um, dingoes and dogs were, were the same, were similar together. And these include, you know, the typical things that, uh, I guess, as dog owners you experience, but, you know, pulling on the leash, hyperactivity, attachment, uh, or separation-related problems, um, and excitability. So, yeah, I, I guess typical things that dogs um, or canids as, as pets um, you would experience or encounter. So there were several differences um, between personality and behavior between dogs and dingoes. And it does confirm many of the things that, that people have spoken about that have, that have experienced living with a dingo. And many of these behaviors definitely lie outside many of those traits that we consider, um, I guess, acceptable canine behavior or things that we, traits that we want in our pet dogs that I spoke, that I spoke of in the early slides. But the continued ownership of these dingoes shows me that, you know, for those owners, that they're not a problem. These dingoes don't represent a problem. Um, are the owners refusing to acknowledge the problematic behaviors? Do they just you know, ignore them uh, and not worry about them? Or have they adjusted their perception and attitudes to meet the expectations of the breed? So if you, get, you, you, you want a breed or you get given a breed and you know that a dingo, that, that breed is gonna be destructive or a certain way, then you're not surprised by it and you kind of are more lenient on those things. And, and as James indicated earlier, you might not um, be, you'll be less willing perhaps to uh, try and uh, I guess solve that or, or change that behavior because you, you just know that that comes part and parcel with owning that particular breed. And so really in the end, if owners do spend enough time uh, and provide the right environment, then dingoes can be potentially good companions, although a lot of things have to go right and I really wouldn't recommend um, dingoes as a pet. Now there were some methodological issues or, or things that, that are important to mention about the, the methodology. And the first one is the self-report. So, you know, perhaps uh, dingo owners want to have dingoes portrayed in a certain way, so they may manipulate the way they, the way they answer the questions because they want dingoes to look um, either positive or negative or, or, some, or, or whatever they, they consider um, they want dingoes to be portrayed as. It's also a biased sample. So, as I said to you, there's quite a high relinquishment rate in dingoes, and these are the dingoes that have made it. These are the ones that have what it takes to be a, a pet dingo, a successful um, household pet. So what about all the characteristics of the ones that don't make it? Um, these obviously can't be considered in, in this study. There's also a small sample size, like I suggested uh, earlier. Um, and the, there's a problem with the dog comparison samples that I used. So um, as you saw in, in the earlier uh, presentations today, there is kind of a, um, a quite, quite a lot of breed differences, so um, it's, it's possibly unfair to compare dingoes to all dogs. Um, we should be really uh, targeting um, specific types of breeds that, that we consider good comparison groups or dogs. 
So why why keep a dingo? What's what kind of what would motivate people? Why do people put up with some of these behaviours um, that may not necessarily be big, uh, big I guess uh, good ones to to have in a dog? Well, it's quite attractive to have kind of a native animal, a really powerful predator in your house, and I think. Um, Getting a rewarding, uh, getting a connection with that, with that species, is kind of a rewarding uh, experience, and that's that's something that I picked up by talking to dingo owners. Perhaps people just think of dingoes as another breed of dog, and and that's just that, that's just what dingoes do. Um, another another big factor I think is that having a a wild animal is a good status symbol. It, it makes you stand out from the crowd. You can use it to impress people. Uh, it's a good topic of discussion. Oh, I've got a dingo, oh, and you know people come up to you in the street and ask you and want to talk to you about your about your dingo. You could also use it to rebel against society's norms. So you know it isn't a normal thing to do to have a dingo. So perhaps you're trying to rebel against um, society, against the government or something. They're also good as, as self-objects, so people maybe identify themselves or traits in the dingo that, that they identify with themselves. Um, with the dingo, for example, they're, you know, they're misunderstood, they're very aloof, they're uh, wild of nature, and they're free-spirited. And these might be things that people identify with, and, and, and they, they, have, they keep a dingo around because that's, that's what represents them, who they are. There's also good social benefits to, to having a dingo because um, they often join societies and, and groups and, and they, they get together with like-minded people, with dingo owners, and they talk about dingoes and their problems and, and how they can uh, uh, I guess do some conservation and education activities. Um, this is a, an example of um, some, some dingo owners who uh, do regular presentations with, with dingoes about dingo education and conservation and they've trained their, uh, their dingoes to howl on command when they, when they say goodbye. So kind of, uh, they, they, there's a sense of self-worth there. That they, they're making a difference. They're, they're doing something positive for dingoes, which is something that, that people definitely identify with. Now, it might be surprising to you that Conrad Lorenz had a pet dingo, and he named it Aboriginal. And, and if you read his, his book, Man Meets Dog, um, it's a fascinating read. He talks a lot about his experience with his dingo. And I think Lorenz neatly summarizes the key behavioral differences between dingoes and dogs when he said, my dingo evidently harbored the warmest feelings for me that such an animal, when mature, can ever feel for another one. But submission and obedience play no part in these feelings. <laughs> so that is to say, the dingo is not a dog and it has no desire to please people. It doesn't want to please you. It doesn't care what you think. And if you have a dingo, the dingo-human relationship is completely on their terms. So that, that, I think, sums up the difference between dingoes and dogs. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. That's fascinating. I don't think I, strictly speaking, have time to ask you an official question, but I'll okay. ask you just a very quick one sure. on the way out because of this quote from Lawrence. Um, I thought I had heard from somebody that Lawrence had deluded himself in believing that he had a dingo. Do you know whether it's whether it's established that he truly had a dingo? Um, it certainly. Lo I've seen photos. It looks uh -huh. a little bit like a dingo. I think a lot of the Europeans had New Guinea singing dogs, and uh, I think it might have been a singing dog that he had, not a dingo. Oh, so okay. Th that's okay. something that that may have may have happened. Yeah. Oh well, great. And I don't want to let you go without mentioning that you've just completed a book on the dingo, and I've I read have. some of the chapters as as Brad was working along, and it's absolutely fascinating. And I can't wait to see it properly in print. I think you told me it won't appear until the beginning of the new year. It won't, right? no, yes. But we'll, lo we'll look out for it. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Cheers.